Hello everyone! Welcome back to Comp 5 to 6. Um, I decided I'll just run this question again because we only had uh, 20 answers or so last time. Um, so maybe you can give me again an update if, if you haven't been with us last time. Maybe just let me know uh, if you have seen string matching algorithms in lectures before. And um, then we'll get started in a second. Um, good. So where's my other window? Um, as always, if, if anything happens, um, put uh, stuff in, in the Q&A or on the Campus Wire back channel. Uh, this one, just to remind you that these two exist. And um, okay, thanks a lot. Um, many more votes and um, many more votes for none, which means uh, many of you haven't uh, seen string matching. Okay. Um, with that, I think we're ready to go. Uh, we started last time. Uh, let me switch this over here. We started talking about string matching last time, and I basically gave you the introduction or the notation for strings that I want to use. So uh, what that is, is, uh, come on, we went through this part. Um, basically, strings have this, this notion of an alphabet. That was this here. And uh, this is just a finite a set, a finite sequence of things. And uh, can be anything, but usually we think of these as fairly small and as letters. It could also be integers in some applications. Uh, then we had a couple of notations. If you're given an, an, an alphabet, that denotes the num the strings of length exactly n. So, for example, sigma 3 would be all the strings of uh, length exactly um, 3. And then the star denotes all those that have arbitrary length, including zero, which would be the empty string. And uh, sigma to the plus, without notation, we mean all non-empty strings, so length at least one. Uh, we went through uh, some more about the, the subs, uh, substrings. I uh, want to ask a question about that in a second. This is what we went over last time. And then um, for string matching, we have a text and we have a pattern. We try to find the pattern in the text in in the haystack uh, in this other notation. And here again, um, I want to stress we are, our algorithms, my algorithms are always formulated so that they find the first occurrence. And um, yeah, you can, you can find all occurrences by iterating that procedure. All right, um, because I felt uh, this type of notation is new to um, many of you. Uh, let's have another go at, at a question like this. It's very simple. I mean, if, if, you, if you've seen this, you will, you will find this very simple. Uh, but I want to give you another chance to uh, A, wake up, and B, practice, practice this so that we're all comfortable with using this notation. So you're given a string Come five to six is fun, including these space characters that I just draw in this funny way so that you can properly see them. And uh, where are you guys? Okay, results are trickling in. Maybe the delay today is a bit longer for YouTube. Um, yeah, I see, I see good answers, but I want to see a few more. Yeah, uh, you can't really type this space character, so you have to be inventive if you need it, but uh. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, uh, I'll give you a few seconds. The main reason I'm, I'm stressing this notation so much is that we will use this 
uh, today a lot, so I want to be the I want to make sure that this is crystal clear to everyone. Uh, while we're waiting, a reminder about the uh, video presentation articles. Um, by the official due date, you should all have submitted an article with your group. But um, the selection of the article itself is not marked, so uh, you just lose your time to prepare the video if you submit the article late. And, and remember, um, all articles need my um, approval. So if, if you're unsure if your article is suitable, if it's maybe not from the explicit list, then uh, uh, send it in as soon as possible so that I can have a look over it. Um, if you've done that till yesterday, you should have received some feedback already. All right, uh, I think it's time to move on. Um, here are the results, and as you can see, many people uh, found P5 to 6, and that is also the correct answer. Um, just to make this, this clear again, um, we start counting at 0 in our strings, so if you just write uh, the string like this and put the indices on top, then we start with 0, but we stop before the 7, so this notation with the round parenthesis is excluding the 7 itself, so it's, uh, it's this highlighted substring. Uh, not complicated, but I want to make sure um, everyone's on the same page with this before um, we dive into the actual algorithms for string matching. Okay. With that, uh, we're ready to go. Um, today, I want to discuss a lot of string matching methods, um, a whole variety, and as you will see, uh, we'll discuss this at the end a bit. They all have their, their pros and cons. So they all have a place to be, um, but it's it's interesting to see that uh, these are um, that that these come from very different ideas. Um, all right, let's uh, let's dive into this. In the next subsection, after introducing the notation for string matching, I want to look at the very first and simplest uh, string matching algorithm, and that's just the the brute force method. Normally, um, brute force sounds really slow, but in this case, you will see brute force is not as bad as it may sound. A general thing that is true for almost all of our algorithms for string matching is that they, they can be described in terms of guesses and checks. And here, um, a guess is a position in the pattern, uh, in the text, at which the pattern might start. So. Uh, it's a guess because we don't know yet, but um, whenever you have a text, T, a long text, you can always try and guess that the pattern might be found at this position, starting at this position. That guess may or may not be justified, and uh, initially, if you know nothing about the text, any guess uh, might, be, might be justified. But as you learn more about the text through comparisons, uh, some guesses are becoming impossible. The way to find out is a check, and a single check is a single comparison of two characters. Uh, we sometimes write this as this um, shorthand. So if, if you start at position i and you check the jth uh, character in the pattern, then this is really doing this comparison. There's one character here, and you compare if that one matches the corresponding position in the text. That's all that there's that is written here with um, the appropriate um, computation on the indices. Okay. So algorithms will um, differ in how in what guesses they make and in what order and what type of checks they do, and uh, that's that's the process. But these two things um, will reappear in in the algorithms. Um, some. Simple observations are that if you want to verify um, uh, a correct guess, so uh, an actual occurrence of the pattern, there's no way around doing m checks. Remember, um, m is the length of the pattern. That was something in the notation, but I didn't stress it today, so maybe um, just to, to recap. 
you need M checks to verify that the pattern is really found at a certain position. So there's no way to really say from that. Uh, but if you want to debunk a guess, um, if you have a guess that is not correct, then it might take much fewer checks to recognize that this is incorrect. A single mismatch is actually enough. So it will be interesting to see how we can get the mismatches, the incorrect guesses, sorted out quickly. Whereas for the correct guesses, there's not so much you can really do. The cost measure that we will mostly focus in this unit is the number of character comparisons. So that's individual characters from the alphabet, one in the text, one in the pattern, or maybe also between text and between pattern. And we compare whether those are equal or not. Um, the only thing we can do is really check uh, ti equals pj. That is uh, what we can do. I'm stressing this because, for example, we cannot ask if one character is smaller than the other lexicographically or something like this. We will not need that in, in the algorithms in this section. An obvious um, bound on the cost that we can always get by with, unless we're doing redundant comparisons, is n times m. There are at most n guesses, actually n minus m are enough, uh, but that's roughly n. And uh, to check whether each guess is correct, uh, the, the worst number we can need is m. So that's, that's really an upper bound on the string matching problem. And if m is very, very small, if you're just looking for a pattern of two or three or five characters, uh, maybe m times n is really not that bad. It's essentially scanning the text once. Now let's look at our first algorithm for string matching. And it's a very simple one. It's brute force. So it says, try all guesses and do the checks just as they come. The only uh, slight optimization that's built into this is that we stop if we have a mismatch. We don't stupidly keep going if we already know that the current guess must be incorrect. That's the only thing. So. Uh, in code, that means we iterate through all the guesses. These are exactly the guesses that uh, you've seen on the previous slide. Then we iterate j from 0 up to m minus 1. That's all the positions in the pattern, uh, left to right. And um, if we ever find a mismatch, that means we stop this inner loop. If we keep running the inner loop till the end, that means if j is m after the loop, then we found a match and we return that position. Remember, we just return the first match. Uh, so all we have to do is return this position i at this point. Uh, let's do an example just to make this clear. Um, let's see. Well, maybe black is, is, uh, is best to read. So uh, what, what these colored um, boxes symbolize is, so here's the text, right? And we try to fit the pattern in here. And the pattern here is ABBA. So we do the comparison with A and that actually matches. The second character B matches too. The third character matches as well, but then the last one is a mismatch. But we had to look at all the characters here. Now, okay, that was not a match. Maybe we try the next guess. So we start with B, but that's immediately a mismatch. The pattern starts with A, so we don't have to compare all the other ones in this, in this position. Same thing happens here and here. Then again, uh, A is a match, B is a match, but here we have a mismatch, so uh, we don't have to compare this one. And uh, this goes on. Um, here we have a match, a match, a match, and then actually here we find the pattern. So, uh, well, had I remembered what number was the, the guess here, so that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we would return a match at position 6 at this point. That's all that happens. Here is that written in um, nicer font. And if you count, then you see you need 15 character comparisons in this example. Whereas this product, the upper bound n times m is 44. So that's, uh, I don't know, a third of the cost. That's not that bad, um, but it was a small and specific example. What's interesting is that uh, this algorithm, essentially in the way I wrote it there, even though um, uh, 
hidden deep in a in a in a in a hidden function, in a private function, the Java library has um, a method called string index off. And uh, this one um, is essentially implementing this brute force method. So it can't actually be such a bad method, right? Now, uh, this is also my, my take on the brute force method. It often is actually good enough. But sometimes often is not, not good enough. Um, we'll, we'll see. And uh, for natural language text, where we have um, specific words and uh, not all possible combinations of characters really occur. Only the specific small subset of our dictionaries really occur. Um, so it, it works fairly well for natural language text because of that. And for completely random strings, it also works, works well because you often get early on mismatches if everything's completely random. Uh, but it, it does come, become pretty bad in examples like this if the text is all A, so the pattern is all A's except for a B at the end. You always keep comparing from the beginning. You already know uh, there's this B at the end, uh, but you, you keep... And what's, what's worse, you know that there's all A's up here, but you forget this. Uh, you don't use that knowledge uh, for the next guess. And so in this case, you do get uh, essentially the worst case bound of n times m for the brute force method. So if there's a, if there's a chance that this is, this is what happens in your application, the brute force method is not good enough. And if you need um, strong guarantees about what can possibly go wrong, uh, because maybe the user supplies the text and pattern that you're searching, then the brute force method just doesn't cut it. Um, one observation for that leads into um, the next section is uh, this is um, a particular, a particularly bad input which has um, a lot of self similarity. Uh, what makes this redundant here is we already knew there are A's in the text, so why check the same A's again here? Uh, and uh, this kind of, of redundancy or um, uh, superfluous comparisons should be able to be avoided, um, and that's that's something we'll we'll look into. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, we should be able to exploit these redundancies both in the text and in the pattern. And that's what we'll look at next. Uh, if you have any questions, then um, please let me know at this point. Um, it's always a good time. Um, OK. Then. Um, Let's move on. I have a, a little I have a little roadmap here because basically this week and the unit um, six that we'll talk about in, in a week or two, or maybe starting before Easter and then finishing after Easter, depending how it works out. Uh, they belong a bit together. They both um, discuss the problem of finding patterns in text. This, um, there's two approaches really. One is uh, that we spend some time on looking at the pat looking at the pattern closely to avoid redundant work when we find it in a in a new text. This is uh, what we'll look at today. Uh, there's also the opposite idea. If if your text is is static and doesn't change, like it's an actual dictionary for for English, but uh, much more importantly in in bioinformatics, the human genome of a certain person doesn't change all the time. Uh, if if uh, if it does, that's actually very bad news for that person. So usually it it stays the same in most cells. Uh, and then it makes sense to pre-process the text, whereas the pattern might depend on on the application, depending on what the doctors need to know about that person's genome. So we'll look in in unit six um, at methods how you can pre-process the text and make use of that to uh, to speed up pattern matching. But for, uh, for this week and for today, we'll start with uh, the opposite version. The pattern is fixed, and we, we work on the pattern first, and then we do the matching.
We've seen our first simple method, the brute force string matching method, which was okay, but sometimes had uh, really poor behavior. And one reason for that is that it doesn't exploit regularities in the pattern. In this next subsection, we want to look at a first attempt to overcome this. And um, for all of those, for all those of you who have seen a formal language class, you actually have uh, all the knowledge that is needed for that, except you might not realize it. And for all those who haven't seen uh, regular expression and, and grammars and all and automata, um, we'll, we'll briefly recap how these things work. Before we start with that, though, I want to see how familiar you are with these things. Um, no, I don't seem to have that question prepared. So uh, let me just start this as um, So I'll just put in the, the dummy options for you, and uh, you can use the slide then. OK, so ignore the, the text in the question on Slido. Uh, I somehow lost the, the question when I prepared the session. Um, but just uh, use what's written on the slide. OK, I'll probably have to switch back and forth a couple of times. Uh, remember, A means you haven't heard of this. You see the results next to it, but I want to show it uh, for the video as well. And B says uh, you remember the terms vaguely, but not very well. And uh, C and D are means um, you're fairly familiar with it. And uh, I think most people have voted now, and most people seem to either not have heard it at all or just vaguely remember it, weren't curators enough to claim that they, they do remember. Uh, so that's that's fine. Um, that means um, I will go slowly over these parts. Uh, thanks for participating in the poll. Um, if, you, if you do know, then this problem becomes simple because you can recognize it is asking the following question. Uh, if you're if you're looking for the pattern in for a pattern in the text, so here's our text again. I'll draw these pictures 500 times, so um, get used to this. Uh, if we try to find the pattern in here, it actually means so. If if these match at this point, I will I will draw these little lines to say that uh, there's equal characters in these ranges. What that really means is there's the pattern here and then arbitrary stuff uh, before and after it. And that together gives you the text. OK. Another way of saying we can find the pattern in the text is saying the text is Something followed by the pattern followed by more something, a different something potentially. And this is uh, what formal language people write in this way. This is the set of all strings over this alphabet sigma. So that's stuff. This is, again, more stuff. And there's the pattern in between. So this, uh, this term is the set of all strings that are formed by something followed by p followed by something. And something can be empty in both cases. OK, um, people from, from regular expression, uh, people from, from formal languages uh, will know that this is a regular uh, expression, which means that this language that results from it is a regular language, a formal regular formal language. And uh, um, if you've seen an automata class, then you will know that for all regular languages, you can find a deterministic finite automaton a DFA that recognizes this. And by simulating this DFA on the text, so you feed the text one character at a time into this automaton, you can read off from the automaton uh, what is the, uh, if, if you find a pattern and at what position. 
Okay, uh, that's pretty cool. So uh, as the theoretician would say, job done, let's go home. Uh, the practitioner, the, the, the programmer who wants to implement this might say, hold on, uh, not quite. Uh, first of all, I don't know about all this stuff, so please help me out. And uh, more seriously, also, if you, if you do know, uh, this just says there is such an automaton, but uh, it's not clear how to compute it, maybe. And the second problem is these automata can be very, very big. And then they would be close to useless for an efficient algorithm. It turns out both problems are not a real problem. They can be very efficiently solved, but they require a little closer a look than our theory professor might might have thought at uh, first shot. Okay, um, to recap, uh, for those of you who have never seen this, uh, this is what people usually mean if they draw automata. It's a, a directed graph. There are these circles, that's, these are states that you can be in. And then there are arcs or directed edges uh, with uh, letters on them, which are the labels um, that are assigned to this. And um, you, can, you can simulate such an automaton by basically starting with the start state. So this, this arrow indicates where to start. And then whenever you read the next character, you just follow the edge that is labeled with that character. Okay, um, maybe I'll uh, show you just the picture for the moment. This automaton is built from the pattern and you can see this by uh, reading the characters on this uh, chain of, of, of states from 0 to 7, you read exactly the pattern. A, B, A, B, A, C, A, that's our pattern. Um, what you do if you want to find the pattern in the text now is you simulate the automaton on the text. Uh, let's do that briefly together. We start with the initial state zero. Here's the text, um, already prepared this in this table. So we read an A, we're in that state zero at the moment, so we check what edge goes with an A, so that goes to state one. Now we read an A again, and the arc says we stay in state one. So we are in state one still, now we read a B and the edge for B goes to state two. Okay, so now we're in state two and we read an A, so you, you see how this goes. Uh, state three with a C leads us back to zero. Um, from zero with an A we go back to one and another A we stay in, in one. Now reading a B takes us to two again, then we read a, th a Another A takes us to three. Read another B here. So that takes us to four. And now things get slightly more interesting. We actually get to um, the end of this automaton. And uh, at this point, we have, we have reached this um, node seven, uh, this, this state seven, and that's double circle. That means it's an absorbing, it's a final state, an accepting state. If you end up in that state, you will accept the input. So automata always do one or, one or two things. You feed them with a string and they either tell you, I like this string, or they tell you, I don't like this string. They accept it or they reject it. And they accept it exactly if and only if you end up in a final state after reading the input. Okay, we do uh, one more A, but then here um, the entire alphabet just keeps us in in this final state. So that means this automaton is built so that if there is an occurrence of the pattern in T, that first occurrence will take you to state seven and you will stay there indefinitely. Which also means the first point where you found state seven, that is the end of the first occurrence, right? So you can find a, here is your occurrence of the pattern A, B, A, B, A, C, A. That's pretty easy. That's um, mostly what we need from automata theory. Um, uh, the other things, there's a few uh, other concepts that will make more sense if you've seen them before. Otherwise, the motivation might not make so much sense to you, but you can still follow along by just uh, looking at, at the examples and uh, listening to what I say. So here's that table filled out in nicely. Uh, 
what is going on here and what is what is um, the intuition behind this? And I want to um, stress that part. So this uh, this automaton, I just threw this at you and I, I said this is built from the pattern and we will look uh, closely at what that means um, and how to build it. The main insight um, that is behind this automaton is, is this invariant. Uh, if you're currently in state Q, it means you have seen a prefix of the pattern of Q characters, position zero up to Q, but excluding Q, remember? Uh, so this is, this is the longest prefix of the pattern you have seen up to now when you start um, when you start reading the text. So that's the longest prefix of the pattern you can find in the, the current portion of the text. Uh, and no longer prefix of that exists. Um, so this is this is shown down here, but um, in a we need that picture for something else. Um, let me let me show this again. So one more time, my favorite picture. Here's the text. The light's doing weird things today. Um, you feed the text through this automaton. So there's a certain portion of the text that your automaton has not yet seen. Okay. So this is this is the prefix that um, the automaton really has read. You feed this into the automaton character by character. And uh, after every character, this, the automaton changes state. And um, that state tells you what it currently thinks it has seen. And if um, at this point you're in state Q, after reading this last character, then it means that there's a prefix of the pattern. Maybe the pattern would be here, but we don't know if this matches. The only thing we know is that up to here it matches. And uh, this is this matching part is exactly up to sorry uh, up to up to state up to letter Q, but excluding this last one. Okay. Um, that is what is meant by this invariant, and that's how this cons this automaton is, is constructed. Um, why, why, why can something like this work? Um, so here, the puzzling thing is that this automaton is only constructed knowing the pattern. It doesn't know the text, and the same automaton works for all texts. Uh, that might be a bit surprising. How is this possible? Because um, if the automaton only knows the pattern, how can it react correctly to all possible texts? Uh, and the answer to that is, is in this observation here. Um, the automaton, or its state to be more precise, tells us that uh, the text we've seen so far ends with a certain prefix of the pattern. That was the previous state, Q. And now we read one more character from the text, C. Um, if we have a... Um, if we have a mismatch, if we do have a match, then we just go to the next state and uh, we know again um, more about the text. We have learned more about the text by knowing that there's one more character we could match. But uh, how do we know what to do if it doesn't match? Um, then we know that this is not a prefix of P. And we know uh, before we had C, this was the longest prefix, okay? So this also means um, if you're looking at if you're looking at this picture down here, if the text currently ends with um, this, uh, shouldn't be the entire text. There can be stuff before it. I forgot to draw the stuff. So uh, T is stuff followed by a prefix of the pattern, and now this new character C, which uh, is not the next character in the pattern, so this is, um, it's not PQ, otherwise we would not be in this case. Um, then we would want to find a new state Q prime, and that state can only be smaller 
So it's completely uh, determined by the characters we already know and the one character that we read. So all the information to decide uh, what happens is already in the automaton. I hope this uh, helped a bit to clarify why the automaton really has all the information necessary to determine what next state to go to, and hence to decide whether the pattern occurs in the text. Now another idea from formal languages. Um, it, we still need to construct this deterministic finite automaton. If we have it, we know how to find uh, for any text whether the pattern occurs. That part's fine, uh, but how do we find it? And uh, we can do a very simple thing. We can just write the pattern on this chain of, of states and uh, don't add any other edges. This is not a valid DFA because we don't know where to go if we say are in state four and read a C. But there's another type of automaton, the non-deterministic finite automaton NFAs that do allow this by having an implicit uh, garbage state. If you ever take a, an edge um, that's not there, you essentially, um, well, you should go back to zero in this case. Um, so this is, this is in a sense, um, the non-deterministic non finite automaton for the right language. And uh, we could use this um, to do matching directly. Um, what you do for this is you are not in a single state, but you're in a set of states. So let's see uh, how this works in, in an example again. Same, same text as before. And again, uh, here the automaton is constructed from the pattern, but the construction is very simple. You just write down the pattern like this. Initially, you're just in state zero. Now, after you read A, you can either take this edge to one or you stay in zero. So you're, uh, in a sense, in a quantum sense, maybe you're in both states zero and one. You don't know which one it really is and both are possible. You read another A that can take you from zero to one, but you already are in state one, or it can take you from one, uh, basically, um, to nothing, so that state's dropped, but you can still stay in state zero and uh, uh, also add the zero again. So you get zero and one. Now, if you read a B, the things become a little more interesting. Well, the, the parallel world that was in state one, the B takes us to state two. So we have state two in the new set. We could also have been in state zero and then a B would have taken us back to state zero. So we can be in states zero and two after reading the B here. If we now read an A, uh, we get from state two to state three, we get from state zero to state zero or to state one. So now we have all of these as a possibility. If we now read C, then no matter where we were, uh, the three cannot continue with the C. So that parallel universe just collapses and is gone. The same for the one. Whereas uh, if we are in um, state zero, we would again stay there. So we always have state zero in this in this automaton. Okay. Um, if you continue simulating it like this, always go from all possible states of the world to all possible successor states. Um, then what you reach here is. Uh, there's a, a state where I do have the state seven, the accepting state as one possible way the world could have come. And uh, that means I accept. So at this point, again, I have found my pattern. It's the same occurrence as before. So this is all fine. In principle, this would work. Uh, but maintaining these sets of states and going through, um, going through all possible states each time and finding uh, what could be this new successor states, that's, um, that's almost, almost as expensive as doing the brute force algorithm. So this is not quite uh, helpful yet. Now, again, uh, theoretical computer science comes to uh, the rescue here in, in that you can always take an NFA and transform it into a DFA. There's an algorithm called the power set construction and uh, there's another algorithm called the, the myhill narod DFA minimization. You can apply these two and then you get uh, the best possible DFA. 
just starting with the NFA, which, um, as we've seen, is very simple to get. Uh, but here, the objection from the from the programmer or algorithms person is that the state space can blow up exponentially. That's uh, what's coming from this power set. Uh, so this might not be very efficient. So what can we do about this? Um, three very clever people found that um, you don't have to go this route. You can instead, because these are very specific automata, these are not arbitrary DFAs or NFAs. They are specifically from the string matching problem. So you can actually construct them uh, inductively. You can start with uh, an automaton for the pattern where you leave off the last character. And now you try to add that in and uh, see what happens. And um, so let me try to draw this, this part here. Um, you previously have this automaton a j minus one, and now uh, you add you add one more state, namely the state j plus one. So that one's new, and you add a new edge, this one with p j. That is the new match edge. That's the, the edge you take if you find the correct, uh, the correct symbol that continues your pattern. Um, but you also need to find these edges that go back. So that first part, that's the easy, easy part. Maybe um, color code this a bit. And tick. OK, I want the entire edge to be green. So um, that's this part. Uh, we also need the other part. We also need these outgoing edges. Um, I don't know, make it red because it's hard. So these are the transitions if we read a character that does not match. We have to go to some state here, but uh, we have to figure out which state that is. That is a little less obvious um, which state that, that should be. OK. Um, in, in automata speak, this is called the transition function, often denoted as delta. So you go from state j to and read symbol c. Then this delta j of, of j and c tells you where to go, what's the next state. Um, how can we find this, this delta j c? Uh, for that, let me draw a different picture. Uh, it's it's almost the same as my as my usual one. <laughs> so here's a prefix of our pattern. That's the pattern up to char character J. That's what we previously had. And let's try to add one more character, the C. So this uh, transition function. Um, Remember from before what the states mean. I think this is uh, useful to rem to point out again. State Q should mean that we've seen this prefix on the, of the pattern and no longer thing. Okay, that's that's the intuition. And um, that means we should now find this longest prefix that matches with the C attached to it. So what we need is. Um, this shifted so that uh, in here we have so the the entire thing would again be p zero j but now we need that um, the parts here are equal including the new character c and um, the length of that thing is uh, our new state. So I don't know, maybe I can draw this inside here. This, the length of this is um, our new state Q prime. Um, so, so again, um, this is what we want. 
we currently have seen a prefix of the pattern. Now we read one more character that doesn't match. That means we have to shift our pattern to the right, but we want to take as many of the matching characters as possible. So we only want to shift as much so that we have the next, the next part that is, that is aligned and all these characters match. So we want the length of the longest prefix of the current match. That is a suffix of this thing. So it's a suffix when I cut off the first character. I don't want the same string again. And uh, that's the state of the automaton after reading this. Um, and that state is less than j because this length red cannot be as long as the current match. It has to be strictly smaller. There was a mismatch, so we have to shift by at least one. And that means um, it's part the we find the red thing again in our automaton that we already have. Okay, because the state number is smaller, we already know that this state is in the automaton and we never need to go uh, beyond state J. So in a sense, we can, um, we can run this old automaton and uh, on the one shorter thing. And um, from that, we get the next, uh, the transitions for the new state. This sounds, uh, this might sound a bit abstract and complicated. There's a concrete example um, coming up next. I just want to point out that um, this seems to require simulating the smaller automaton m times sigma times. Whenever I add a new state, I have to simulate it for all possible symbols. And uh, fortunately, that's, that's not the case. Um, but maybe let's go back and do an example in in this automaton here. Um, suppose we want to find the uh, edge that goes from state 3 with an A. So we currently have constructed only this part of the automaton. Um, without the three, that's what we have up to two. Now we're adding this new state and we're adding this edge. That's the easy edge. Now we need these two edges. Um, what happens if I read an A? What happens if I read a C? So let's look at what happens if I read an A. I currently have in, in state 3, we have this uh, P, 0, J, and the new C. What we read is A, B, A, and then another A. A, B, A is the part of, is the prefix of the pattern that we found when we reach state 3. And now we read an A, which is not the right character. We can't move forward, but we have to jump back. Uh, what we do now is we leave off the first A and simulate the automaton on BAA. So we essentially ignore this A here. So let's do that. We start in the initial state. B takes us back to 0. A takes us to 1. Simulate A again. So we end in state 1. And voila, this is where from 3 the arc goes to. That goes to state 1. This is exactly what happens here. So to construct one new edge, we can take what we currently read from the pattern plus the new symbol. And we just take the first character off and simulate that in the automaton. Then you get the result of the, the uh, target of that edge. That works fine. Just again, this seems like it's very expensive. Okay, so that's that's this comment. It would work, but it's not what we want because it's slow. Uh, 
a second insight from the same three clever people shows you you can actually um, do this last step um, in one shot uh, by simply doing a copy step and one update. And I found this is so nicely explained in these lecture videos of, of uh, Robert Sedgwick and Kevin Wayne that there's no way I'm going to explain this in a nicer way. So I'll, I'll just show you this video instead. Uh, so here it goes. Well, let's take a look at a demo that does the uh, full construction for the KMP uh, DFA. Uh, so uh, here goes uh, again, uh, one state for every character plus an accept. Uh, match transitions are easy. Uh, we build those uh, and uh, we're going to start at position zero uh, and uh, the mismatch transitions are easy. Yeah, I muted myself again so that uh, I don't disturb the video. So what I was saying is what you see here in this table is the targets of the arcs here. If you're in state 0 now, you read an A that takes you to state 1. So that's why this entry in that row and in that column is a 1. You're currently in state 0, you read an A that takes you to state 1. And the other two take you to state 0. Okay. Uh, Back, back to Cedric. Uh, so uh, now when we move over, uh, X is, and when we're in position one of the pattern, X is where we would be if we uh, started out without that character, which would be the empty string. Uh, so uh, we start out with uh, just filling in zeros. Uh, uh, for state zero, um, and we can uh, do that without uh, any further reasoning. But now we've got X initialized. Uh, so now what we need to do is uh, fill in uh, the mismatch transitions uh, for state one. Uh, so what are they? They're uh, what would happen if we found those characters uh, uh, in, uh, <coughs> and we were in state X. If we found an A, we'd go to state one. Uh, if we found a C, we go to state zero. Uh, and maybe you notice that's just taking uh, the entries corresponding to the entries we need uh, from X's column and putting it in J's column. That's all it is. Uh, and then we need to uh, update X, uh, which is where it would be uh, if we match to B. Uh, so we'll stay in, X will stay in state zero. So now uh, let's look at state two. So uh, we need to fill in what would happen if we got a B and what would happen if we got a C. Well, it's what would happen if we were in state X and we got a B or a C. So all we do is move those two zeros over to column two. Uh, and then don't forget, we have to update X and X goes where uh, the machine would go if we saw an A, that transition from two to three. So we just move X to state one. Uh, so now we have X in state one and we're doing position three. And now you can see how really simple the algorithm is once it gets going. Uh, so uh, now the mismatch transitions are A and C. Uh, and that's what we have to fill in for column three. Uh, but those mismatch transitions were already computed. Uh, that's where X would go. Uh, if we, that's where it would go if we happen to be in state one. So we move the one and zero from column one over to column three. And again, we update X. Uh, and when we see a B, uh, X uh, goes to state two. Uh, and <clears throat> again, you can check what, what is X supposed to be. It's, a, it's supposed to be uh, where you would be if you started the machine on the pattern with the first letter cut off. So it's, it's supposed to be, where would you wind up if you got B-A-B, B-A-B, and that's a check. 
All right, so now uh, stage four. Stage four, we have to fill in B and C. We go to X's column and copy over B and C from X's column. Uh, then we update X, uh, that's if you see an A, you go to state 3. Uh, now uh, we're ready for state 5, we've got X all computed, uh, and we need to do uh, A and B, and we get those from X. If it's an A, it's a 1, uh, and if it's a B, it's a 4, it's just move them over. Uh, and then uh, when we do the C uh, and get the accept, uh, there's no mismatch. Uh, that's the, uh, we do update X to get ready. Uh, but uh, when we get to state six, uh, we're done. And again, it's just as a double check, uh, X is where you'd be if you saw B, A, B, A, C. Uh, that's the construction of the Knuth Morris Pratt uh, DFA. All right, uh, there we're back. Um, I hope you could follow through this. Um, what, what was what was done in this algorithm to compute this DFA was that uh, instead of figuring out the endpoint for each of the different transitions, you figured out uh, that there is a single state X from which all these uh, transitions have already been computed in a previous step because the same computation is done over and over. So you could just copy that state's transitions and overwrite just one of the edges, namely the one for the match transition. And X had to be the state that you are in after reading the pattern with the first character excluded. Uh, that's, that's all there is to computing uh, this string matching DFA. All right, um, this was the first non-trivial algorithm for string matching. You compute with the procedure that we've seen at the very end, um, the, this finite automaton, and then you simulate that on the text. I think this is a good point for um, a very short break, but I don't want to lose too much time. So maybe let's just do uh, two minutes today and uh, see you again at uh, one past noon. All right, I warned you, just a, a very short break um, for today because uh, I think we, we should move on um, with this topic. I don't want things uh, to shift too much, um, but I also don't want to uh, rush these concepts too much because uh, so many people haven't seen formal languages in automata. In the next subsection, I want to introduce the actual knuth morris pratt algorithm for string matching. We've heard these three names in the last section on, on the string matching automaton, on string matching with deterministic finite automata already. And uh, indeed, the very same ideas um, that we used there were essentially developed by these people in a slightly different way. They were formulated in a slightly different way. So the previous subsection was supposed to be an easier to follow introduction to uh, this algorithm, but it should really be seen as the continuation or the, uh, the better way to use the, their insights. Um, 
if we remember what we did for the for the DFAs, um, the uh, string matching with with DFAs was fast. You know what? I think I skipped the slide here on the discussion. So this still belongs into the subsection on on matching with deterministic finite automata. Okay, I messed up the recording now. Um, but I do want to stress this part here. So how, how well does this work, um, string matching with deterministic finite automata? Um, the running time is very good for the matching part. It's essentially just uh, a lookup in this, in this table that we've constructed, um, as you've seen in the video. So you do uh, this table lookup given the state and the transition and update the state. That's at fast, as fast as uh, you can go. Building the automaton, um, it needs m times sigma time because um, you do need uh, to write that uh, table. You have to copy these columns. Um, initially, it looked like we might get um, another factor of sigma, but this is, uh, this is really the time that, uh, that we need. And so the total time is um, this n for uh, the matching part and um, m times sigma for com constructing the automaton. And we also need m times sigma space. That is just the size of this transition table. The good things about matching with string matching automata with DFAs is the matching time is really hard to beat. Um, these table lookups are almost as easy as you can get. Uh, and the total time is, is optimal if the alphabet size is fairly small. And by optimal, I mean here it's theta of n plus m, which would be the time for just reading the pattern once and reading the, te the text once. You clearly have to read at least every character so you can answer this uh, pattern matching question in, in the worst case. Okay. So that's good. Um, what, is, what is not great yet is the substantial space overhead for this m times sigma. Um, think of, of something like Unicode, where uh, sigma could easily be, well, in the billions, I guess. Um, how big is the Unicode character set? Um, I don't even have the up-to-date figures, but um, well, the used character sets maybe is 100k characters. Um, I'll, I'll look it up and put it in the notes what the actual current count is. This is counting all the characters in all the languages that humanity ever used, plus all the emoji, plus a lot of extra stuff, mathematical symbols and all these things. So sigma can actually be very big. Even if m is small, this uh, space overhead can be a problem. Okay, back to this. Um, in this subsection, I want to introduce the knuth morris pratt algorithm. Based on the same ideas we've seen for constructing the DFA for the string matching, um, but trying to overcome the main weakness of uh, the DFAs, namely their space overhead. So this is what, what, uh, what you've just seen. Uh, DFAs are fast, but they need this transition table for all possible alphabet symbols. And um, it seems a bit wasteful to store all these because we just, in the construction, we just copied a column in the table over to the next state. There's a lot of redundancy in this table. So maybe we can do away with this. And that's uh, the third ingenious insight uh, from Knuth, Morris, and Pratt. We can do uh, this last step um, during the matching instead of pre-computing it for all the symbols. If that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, uh, it will make much more sense in a second. And uh, the right way to think about this is, again, an automaton like this, but a slightly different type of automaton. So we use a new type of transition called the failure links. So these are the things that have an, have an X uh, or this, this cross um, on the top, these guys here. Otherwise, uh, this automaton is very similar to the ones we've seen before. It has the pattern on this chain 
to the accepting state. And uh, now what's different is that each state only has one other link uh, other than the matching edge. It only has one other edge and that's the failure link. It's not a it's not exactly um, a com uh, an automaton in the sense of, of formal language theory, because if you transition, if you take this um, failure link transition, you don't consume a character from the text. So if you're sitting in state four and you would like to read a C, the next character in the text is a C, you're not allowed to do this because there's only an A. So you have to take this failure link, but then in state two, you still try to read the same C. So you would take another failure link and then you can read the C actually. That's the, that's the main distinction. Um, here's a more, uh, more detailed example how that works if you go through an entire text. Um, I think um, I'll, I'll just show you the end result. Uh, you do the same construction or the same simulation I just sketched. Uh, whenever you cannot follow this match edge, you have to take failure links and then try again with the same character. Uh, that's, that's the important message here. And it can sometimes happen that you have to go through several states before you can actually uh, process a character. Um, if you are in state three and you try to read another A, you cannot read the A here, so you take the failure link. You cannot read the A here, so you take another failure link, and then you can read the A. So you go from state three to one and zero, and then eventually end up in state one. That is the failure link automaton. And it, uh, as you might already see, now we only have to store one number for each state, namely, where does the failure link go? Uh, and we've lost this dependency on the size of the alphabet. So let's uh, get you guys awake again um, and see if, uh, if you're digested this part about failure automata already. What is the worst possible time it could take to read a single character in the failure link automaton for a pattern? How long can it take to process a single character in the text? Let's have a vote on this. I'd like to see a few more votes. That's okay. We're approaching 20. We did have up to 35 eventually. So maybe I'll give you another second. But I think people are on the right scent for this one. Okay, 25 sounds like a good number. Um, I'll show you the results. And uh, the correct answer is uh, theta of, of m. So that's, uh, that's this one. Um, the, the reason for that is you can basically have an automaton that looks like this. Uh, you can if the pattern is all A's, uh, you would indeed get this. I don't know, maybe one more. Uh, in this in this example, um, the failure links would always just go one go back one state. And if if you have m copies of this and you're in this state and you read something that's not an A, a mismatch. You go one step back, try again. Uh, still not an A. Okay. Uh, you try again, try again, try again. So you could take uh, a long list going back uh, through all the states one hop at a time. That sounds like a problem uh, because we don't really want to spend 
beta m time for each character in the text, that would bring us back to essentially the complexity of the brute force method. It turns out that this is not a problem, uh, but the reason for that uh, needs a closer look. So let's first write down the actual algorithm for Knuth Morris Pratt. Uh, this is this is the code, and um, the first thing it does is uh, compute these failure links. Uh, I'll show you on the next slide how that works. Um, then it iterates with i through all the guesses. Um, that's that's this one, but it's not a simple for loop as it was in the uh, brute force method. Instead, um, it's a while loop and I can jump in, in larger increments. There are two cases. Essentially, we can either find a match. If the next character matches, then we take the match transition in the automaton. So we go from state Q to state Q plus one. Q is the current state in the automaton. I didn't say that uh, even though it's written here. Uh, you start in the start state zero. If you find a match, you go to the next state. Um, and here, uh, I is actually the position in the text that's, um, maybe I should have used I and J separately. So here's I is not exactly the guess. It's not the starting position of a potential match. It's the, the current position in the text that we read. If we end up in state M, that's the accepting state, then we can return the occurrence we found. And because I is the current position in the text, we have to go back by the length of the pattern. So this, I mean, this is uh, equal, so this could also be written as i minus m, maybe more intuitive. If we don't have a match, so the next character is different from what we want to see, uh, we have to do something else. We have to follow a failure link. Uh, there's no failure links for the start state. We just stay where we are. But if we're not in the start state, then we compute the failure link. So the target of the failure link is stored in this array fail. And then we just move our state there. If we are in the initial state, then we advance and go to the next character. Then there was just no way uh, to find that character. This maybe doesn't occur at all in the, in the pattern string. That's fine. Then we just state in the initial state, which says we haven't seen any part of the pattern. Uh, that's how this code works. And let's see how we can analyze it. Uh, maybe turn myself off entirely for this part. Um, how long does it take to execute the entire code going through uh, this this while loop um, with the entire text? Uh, one important observation is the failure links always point backwards, right? We never have um, they always point in that direction. That's um, that's one observation. And now, uh, in each iteration of this of this while loop, we do one of two things for sure. We either advance in the text by one position. That happens here or here. Or um, we shift our pattern forward. So uh, the guess i minus j, where we currently uh, guess that the pattern starts, moves by one step forward. OK. Uh, this is a little more subtle, but uh, whenever we update Q, this is this is essentially um, this is essentially what happens. By um, by going to a smaller state, we implicitly shift the the pattern forward in the text by at least one position because of that. Now. Um, Each of these cases can only happen at most n times because uh, there's only n positions in the text, so we can only advance the text n times. And this also advances the text, but with the pattern. Um, and the pattern can only advance in the text, can also only advance in the text n times. So uh, the entire loop can only be executed at most two n times um, by simply observing that each iteration in the loop makes progress either by moving to the next character in the text or by shifting the pattern along the text um, forward by at least one position. So uh, both 
The green and the blue can either only happen n times, and we do one thing of these at least. So the total loop iteration, the total num number of iterations of the while loop can be at most 2n. And we do exactly one simple comparison in, in each iteration. So that's why we have at most 2n iterations and at most 2n simple comparisons. That's the analysis of uh, knuth morris pratt but we excluded computing the failure links. And that is um, a second important part of the code. So let's look how that works. Remember that the failure links point to this error state x in the construction from the DFA. We will use the very same idea um, that we've seen for constructing the DFA. Um, but instead now of copying over the columns of this transition table, we just store the state x that we are. And that's, that's the only change we need, really. So um, we initialize x to the start state. And the, well, the start state doesn't really have an, a failure link. So this will never be used. And then um, we do something similar. We iterate through uh, the, the pattern. And we set the current state's failure link to whatever x is at the time. And then uh, we update x. So there's two options. Either we can read the next, um, uh, if, if we can read the next character and it's the same as in the pattern, so we can extend the match, then we move with x along the uh, match edge. And that means we just update x to x plus 1. If we don't have a match yet, then we have to follow failure links. But luckily, these are the failure links that we already computed because they're further to the left. Uh, so um, if we've already reached the start state, then we do nothing. Uh, and uh, a quirky way to say this is we set x to minus 1 and then increment it again. Maybe a, a different flow in the code would have made this more intuitive. Uh, if we're not in the state, then we just follow one failure link and then try again. So it's uh, in a sense, we're using the part of the automaton that we've already constructed uh, to simulate what would be the next step for x. And we always store uh, what x was in, in each of the positions. And again, we, uh, we want to analyze how long this takes. This loop takes m iterations. That's easy. But we have this inner while loop that could uh, take our running time beyond m. But indeed, it doesn't. Um, because this, this inner while loop, it always makes m smaller, namely here. Remember again that uh, fail is always smaller than its argument. So that's, that's this part. And we only increment x once per iteration of the outer while loop. So x only ever gets bigger here. So there's no way this, this inner while loop can be executed more often than the outer while loop. Uh, we can basically uh, charge each iteration of this inner while loop to one iteration of the outer for loop. And we only have m iterations for the outer loop. So that means uh, we can in total only have m iterations of the outer loop and m iterations of the inner loop at most. That's another 2m symbol comparisons for computing the failure links. So that's 2m. Previously, it was 2n for the text. In total, it's 2 times n plus m. That's what's written here. That's the time. The character comparisons are 2 times n plus m. And this is optimal in the worst case. There's no way you can do better. The knuth morris pratt algorithm basically gets the time that you need to just read the two pattern, the, the two text, the pattern and the text. So that is the best possible that we can hope for. Uh, and the space is essentially as big as the pattern, but there's no dependency on the alphabet. That's, again, almost as good as it can get. Um, but we'll see some, some further tricks um, later down in this, in this unit. So the total time is asymptotically optimal in the worst case. And that's for any alphabet size. That's really important. Uh, and the, the space overhead is, is much better than for the DFA. That's, uh, that's the Knuth-Moyes-Pratt algorithm. 
Uh, any questions about this? Then I have um, one question for you. Uh, just reflecting a bit um, and um, stressing that part again, what are the advantages of KMP? Uh, you should be able to answer with multiple answers, so check all that apply. And um, yeah, I'll leave you with that for a minute. Okay, we have uh, some votes, but maybe we can get um, a few more. I'd like to see at least the, the 25 that we've had before. Twenty-four. One more. The fingers over the mouse. One more, guys. I see things moving, but people just change their votes. We have twenty-five. So here are here are your answers. And um, the main points are. Uh, let me show this on the other part. Um, KMP is, is faster in terms of the pre-processing because we don't have to factor sigma. It uses less space. That's something I've stressed uh, a lot, so uh, almost all of you ticked this one. And it makes also the entire running time independent of sigma, which is um, an important fact if you use, for some reason, a very large alphabet like you have. You allow the entire Unicode alphabet. All right. Um, that concludes. Uh, the section on, on KMP. Now, we only have a little bit of uh, time left, um, but I do want to explain. Uh, so I, I don't want to start the next subsection, but let me um, let me explain this part. The knuth morris pratt algorithm is, is very useful for match for string matching, and it was the first worst case um, optimal algorithm for this problem. But it turns out that the insights that led to it uh, are much more uh, general than just this algorithm. And um, indeed, there's uh, the this, this failure function that we used, fail of q, which was um, the failure link target. In the, in the literature, there's um, a thing called the prefix function, often denoted by capital F. That's why I didn't use F for our failure function, which is uh, very slightly different, um, but it's almost the same uh, as you can as you can see here. Essentially, it's just a, a shift in the in the argument, and this uh, this failure function, uh, this prefix function, sorry has found uses in many other problems uh, in stringology. Whenever you um, try to answer problems that um, answer questions about strings that have to do with self-similarity and, and overlaps and partial matches, uh, often there's a way to formulate it in terms of this prefix function. So this has, uh, this has become uh, useful and important way beyond uh, the classic string matching problem. So I want to briefly um, discuss this here as well, uh, just um, so that you're aware uh, of the notation and uh, can relate to this. Um, so again, uh, let me indicate this here to make the connection. This is how I defined the fail function. 
um, the prefix function is defined as the length of the longest prefix of this pattern. That is a suffix of, well, the substring, it's the same, it's the same prefix of the pattern, but with the first character omitted. Okay. Um, and uh, that's also, if you translate this to our fail function, you get um, the following property about fail of j. And this is really, really useful. And you should definitely memorize this. And let me draw the picture that belongs to this. Um, here we have our prefix up to excluding this, the chafe character. And now fail j is the length of the longest prefix. So here's the same thing again. Same thing again, but a bit shifted. Now again, yeah, I've drawn this many times. I want that these two parts are equal. So there's a, a self-similarity in this, in this string. There's a part at the end, a suffix that is also a prefix. Okay. So fail chase, the length of the longest prefix of this thing, this prefix, the one that ends here. So this blue part is then only something smaller, j prime. Uh, and this blue part is the longest prefix. That is also a suffix of um, that occurs again here, a suffix of this, and at least one pattern is omitted. So this one means that here is at least one character of a gap. We shift this right by at least one position. And then um, finally, fail j is just the length of this thing. And that is nothing but this j prime. So it's this this length. It's the length of the overlap. Okay, um, this is all I want to say about the prefix function. Um, we will have a look, uh, a closer look at, at KMP and the prefix function or the failure, failure link function in the tutorials uh, to practice that a little bit. I think uh, memorizing this picture and this and this definition is helpful. If you ever see the f and the prefix function used in some book or paper, then uh, be aware of this uh, offset. Uh, it's at the end down to the question: Do strings start with a zero or with a with a zeroth character or with a first character? Um, to be consistent, I chose that strings start with a zero, so that has certain implications and makes some definitions nicer. Here it means that there's a slight uh, difference to how things are done in in many books. Okay, with that, um, let's close the chapter on K and P. Uh, we'll continue tomorrow a little bit more on string matching. Uh, we've seen that K and P is an optimal algorithm, but it turns out you can beat it. You can uh, improve upon this optimal algorithm in an interesting way. And uh, well, I'll tell you more about this then tomorrow. And uh, we'll also conclude this unit then. Um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know on, on Q&A or Campus Wire. Um, I'll also ask the same question as last time again. Uh, if, you, if you have a few minutes and you would like to, um, I'm happy to uh, stay a bit on, on Zoom. Um, if, if you don't feel like it, that's fine too. Uh, it's just an offer. There's no agenda. There's nothing, there's nothing important that you miss if you don't come. Uh, it's just a way of, uh, saying hi and seeing or hearing some of you. Whereas the lecture itself is, is just me talking unless I'm managed to mute myself. Okay. So, 